my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Faye Joes, is Director of the City of Toronto's Children's Services Division. In this capacity, she is responsible for the planning and management of child care services for a geographic center uh, sector of the city. Faye has over 25 years of experience in the children's services sector and is a registered early childhood educator. Faye was recently introduced to the field of recreation as the manager of children and youth with the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Division. She was involved in the development of the Middle Childhood Strategy, which was created through the collaborative efforts of community organizations and both city divisions of Children's Services and Parks, Forestry and Recreation. And she's going to speak to us today about the strategy. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. So, as you know, strategy can be a little bit dry, so I'll do my best to... Uh, to keep it moving and keep it as lively as possible, which is going to be easy to do given that there's colored chickens in front of you. So uh, I'm very aware of the audience here, and I know that uh, you're quite aware of how large Toronto is. So just to put some parameters around this strategy uh, for middle childhood, I, I want to start off with a couple of things. First of all, we're defining middle childhood as children ages 6 to 12. And with what I know is happening in the province of Ontario with after school, after school is fast, including four and five-year-olds too. But for the purposes of this strategy, uh, we have mainly focused on the, the 6 to 12 year old. The other thing that I wanted to really identify as I'm talking is what that scope means for Toronto, especially given that some of you are here from municipalities um, that are smaller than Toronto. And I want you to think just for a minute about the fact that there are 329,000 children in the city of Toronto. <coughs> And of that 329,000, 179,000 of them are between the ages of 6 to 12. So with, with who I know is likely our audience, having been to uh, a pro conference in the past, pro forum in the past, I know that, for some of you, the number of 6 to 12 year olds that we have in Toronto are equal to or greater than some of the municipalities that you live in. So that takes us to why the strategy, what the strategy, and what it is that we're trying to do, and who is it that's trying to do it. We've known in Toronto for a long time that the needs of 6 to 12-year-olds were not um, adequately being met. And uh, when you think about licensed childcare, when you think about recreation, when you think about uh, the needs of parents and families for children from that age group, that the needs for those families are great and that that's a particular age group where developmentally children are still needing care but they are, their care and their development is quite unique. They, it's a, we know that it's a critical time of development and it's when you think about high five and you put high five together with the six to 12 year old, you know how important it is for them to be working with adults that are caring and that the social aspect of six to 12 year olds working with each other is, is the real focus of, of what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I want to talk a little bit about how we're looking at tackling that in Toronto. Um, and want to also talk about families' expectations related to it because you can't put a strategy together without finding out what it is that families are really looking for. So we, what we did was we looked at some research and we found out that families have an expectation that they, for high-quality, age-appropriate programs, both in school and out of school time, no surprise. But it's hard for providers and hard for families to make those uh, things link, to, to put them together. Uh, because in Toronto, we don't have access to, there isn't a wide range of uh, high quality developmentally and culturally appropriate services that support the communities where the children are. So there is a number of uh, stakeholders and agencies, boards and commissions and divisions in the city that got together along with our community partners to look at what the needs were and to look at uh, what could happen around that and identifying that it wasn't just licensed childcare and it wasn't just recreation uh, programs within the city's recreation division. 
In, so in 2009, a coalition of all of uh, those folks uh, developed the Middle Childhood Strategy Framework. And what we did was we committed to developing with the community a comprehensive childhood strategy that provided action steps towards a system of high quality, age appropriate, out of school time programs for children in six to 12. And we took it to Toronto City Council and we said, what do you think? And from that, we had three key components that we went to as the next step. The first one was some research to be able to say, yes, definitively, we are headed in the right direction. Families agree, community partners agree, and the research in terms of the, the, um, the scope of what was being done nationally and what was being done in, into other countries, and we actually included Ireland in, because there's a fair bit of work that's being done in Ireland around this, it all pointed that we were on the right track. Then we developed the strategy, and then following that, we said, okay, the strategy is here. Now we need to do an implementation plan. So that happened in May of 2013. But I want to back it up a little bit to the research in 2011. The um, research that we did, um, and I've got a couple of copies here. I didn't bring one for everybody, um, but I do have a few copies here, and I can talk to you about it afterwards. We, the research was titled An Opportunity for Every Child, Realizing the Potential of After-School Programming for Children Ages 6 to 12. And we looked at best practices and the needs of Toronto families and also the barriers that they face. This document's also online, so um, obviously not enough hard copies for everybody, but it is available online and uh, our website will give you at the end. So we looked at a needs assessment. We did an environmental scan in Toronto of all of the after-school programs that were available, all of them, not just what Toronto, the city offered, not just what uh, Children's Services and Parks, Forestry and Recreation offered, but what does boys and girls offer? What are faith groups offering? What is there out there for families? We did eight focus groups with a total of 83 parents uh, who had children between the ages of 6 to 12, and we focused really in with a deep dive on what is it that you want, what are you looking for, and what are your barriers. We had uh, just over 1,300 surveys that were done online, which is uh, quite an incredible number uh, when you think about the challenges in a very diverse city with literacy and language issues and, and folks' time to be able to identify for us what is it that um, they were looking for and the why and the how. We also did one-on-one -on -one interviews with 24 different researchers uh, to be able to inform where we were headed with the strategy too. Uh, then we did a statistical review of uh, the data and analysis of it and rolled it all up into th this document which then informed um, the strategy. So the strategies uh, main goal was to look at um, building on the research, uh, where, where do we start? Uh, it's to, to ensure that children 6 to 12, along with their families, have access to that high quality. Absolutely, parents, families, researchers, stakeholders said quality is a very key factor. Um, developmentally and culturally appropriate. Culturally appropriate came out again and again and again, as well as that button of we want homework time. So uh, there, was, there was also some other pieces in there are, that families were looking for that we needed to consider too, and really language around how do we define quality and how do we want to move forward with this and, and in what sorts of packages. So the strategy set out the following goals. One, to develop a comprehensive and integrated um, system for of services for children 6 to 12. What we know is that in Toronto, the programs are fragmented. So families were putting together pro uh, after school care for their children that was one day here, one day there, part of the time here, oh, not for our PA day program there. Um, this run program runs for nine weeks, that one runs for 12 weeks. There was a lot of um, disjointedness and we were looking to find a way to collaborate so that families had an easier time to be able to sort out where is the care, what is it, and how do I know what I'm getting by the nature of what it's called uh, by different uh, groups that were offering the care. So we were really looking at aligning it. We were looking at also service planning. 
where should these programs be and where are they not? So around the city, looking at a map, where are the service gaps? Uh, so we addressed that by developing some new planning tools uh, to address the gaps and, and looked at that with all of the service planners in the city. The, and then we looked at that from a local planning lens. What do we need um, in each of the areas? And we, we have started to do some of that work. It's been successful, and we, I'll get into that in a few minutes. We know that people are actively using, that families are actively using that as part of their planning. We also wanted and heard, again, like I said about quality, to develop some strategies to measure and improve the quality of all programs. High quality, as you know, is a real cornerstone for uh, after-school programs. It's something that we all strive for, but we have to be able to define what it looks like, and we want to be able to define what it looks like uh, cohesively from program to program so that parents are able to uh, language and identify and realize and recognize uh, what quality looks like. We, we also wanted it to inform staff hiring. Staff hiring, we heard over and over again, and this is not rocket science for any of you in the room who either are looking for after-school care for a child of your own or a family member that you have been working with for six to 12 year olds, it, it, it's challenging to find. Uh, we needed to know also what the specific elements of quality were, and we're not, we're not quite there yet. This is work that is ongoing, but the strategy identified all of those things. So uh, developing a comprehensive system, improving service planning and coordination, and looking at what quality was. The other, th the other thing that it identified was how do we raise public awareness about the fact that there are 179,000 children aged 6 to 12 that need care after school and in what form do they need it in. Then we wanted to create also opportunities for more research and knowledge of what the best practices are. So how do we, when we discover this, how do we language out what the best practices are? We implemented the plan in 2013. So we're in the beginning of 2014. You realize that we are still actively working on this. We, we took our implementation plan, uh, which was another document, um, to City Council. And the we is anybody who offers care uh, for 6 to 12-year-olds in the City of Toronto. And we said to Council, this is what we want to do. And uh, these are our goals and our actions uh, up to the end of 2014. And we're actively working on that implementation plan. And that work is being carried out by uh, uh, focused groups, but also, and it's the investment of anybody that has care for 6 to 12 year olds. The other thing that we did was we developed a child and family network in the city that is cross-divisional and it in, in the main work of that is that the, the thank you, that the uh, middle childhood strategy on the work plans has been taken on by everybody on that uh, child and family network. So moving forward, um, some of the key things that have already happened out of this is that in order to be able to identify where the service gaps were, we developed a locator. So on our website, you are able to, as a parent, put in an address, buy postal code, and every care option for 6 to 12 year olds will pop up for you in that area. Not just the ones operated by the City of Toronto, but anybody that has, has care or a program recreation-based or not, for 6 to 12-year-olds, will it will show you where it is. We also are in the process of developing those quality standards, and we have buy-in from uh, a very wide, diverse group to develop the quality standards. It will look like a criteria. There will be a parent education component that comes with it. Uh, the other thing that has happened is that the some of the other divisions in the city uh, uh, that are seeing 6 to 12 year olds. So for example, our libraries that end up being care options for families because they send their uh, children to a library at the end of the school day. The library has recognized also that they need a strategy for middle childhood and they have um, done some implementation plans of their own along with working with us so that it's very much a focus. So where do we go from here? Our next steps are to keep focused on the implementation plan. 
We're going to keep providing leadership towards defining what high quality is. And we're going to make sure that we action our partnerships uh, so that everybody that's offering care is headed towards the same goal. And like I said, just to close off, all of that work is available on our um, website. All of the three documents that I've identified, including the one that's in front of you, which is on each of the tables, there's a hard copy of the strategy itself. Um, so the strategy itself, the research, and the implementation guide, A Time for Action, is all available at uh, toronto.ca forward slash children. Hi, Faye. I have a question. You mentioned that four- and five-year-olds, um, that you're seeing an increase in four- and five-year-olds participating in recreation programs. I'm just wondering, the Recreation Act reads six and up. I'm just wondering how you're going about that through the City of Toronto when you're coming from the licensing piece, um, having four- and five-year-olds in um, licensed child care programs. Are you allowing them to participate in your ARC programs? So in the ARC, ARC program, that's an acronym that stands for um, After School Recreation Program, uh, the increase of the four and five-year-olds is in the fact that the parents are looking for before and after school care. Mm -hmm. So it, within the City of Toronto, what we have identified is that where there is a group of 15 children who require care by a family survey, then legislatively, the uh, boards of education are required to either operate or find an operator for licensed before and after school care for those children. In the, on the recreation side, in the ARC programs, we have had a very small number of four and five year olds uh, that can come into our ARC programs, but under some very strict conditions. And it needs to uh, be monitored it needs to make sure that they generally are there because there are sibling, they have a sibling that is 6 to 12. Uh, and we're really looking at a time period in the beginning of when they come as to whether you can manage a 4-year-old in the same program as a 12-year-old, and generally not. So we're looking for that ARC program to have the ability by room size to be able to divide. I'm pleased now to introduce Shauna McClellan, Manager of Community Outreach and Day Camps for the YMCA of Hamilton, Burlington, Brantford. She's a graduate of Niagara College uh, in Early Childhood Education and Mohawk College where she obtained her Certificate in Management in the not-for-profit sector. Shauna has worked with the YMCA for 20 years in a variety of capacities. She welcomes opportunities to work collaboratively and supports many community initiatives. She actively participates in local neighborhood meetings in order to ensure programs are developed in response to community needs. She's involved with several committees in Hamilton, Burlington and Brantford and is mother to two energetic boys. Sean is also a member of the advisory committee for the On After School project, so we've had the benefit of her expertise through this whole project. All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about a conference that we ran in Hamilton, took, uh, took place in September of 2013, and it was a conference for youth workers, and uh, it was put on by a group that I'm involved with called YSAN, which stands for Youth Serving Agencies Network. So what YSAN is, is it's a group of city staff uh, from the rec department, from the libraries. We've got smaller uh, community groups uh, that are unique to Hamilton, such as Wesley Urban Ministries, HARP, Eva Rothwell Center, Child and Youth uh, Organization, and Living Rock. And then we have our bigger uh, national organizations, such as uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, John Howard Society, and the YMYWCAs. So we were doing a visioning exercise, and as part of our mission, we wanted to uh, make sure we're educating people in Hamilton, specifically the youth workers in Hamilton. Even more specifically, we wanted to make sure we were uh, engaging those uh, faith-based organizations, you know, that might only have one or two volunteers and aren't maybe as large as the YMCA. We wanted to make sure that we were also giving opportunities to um, college students to have a, more of a grassroots uh, impact and see what it's like working frontline. So what we did was we decided to kind of pool all our resources from all the different agencies and host a conference. It was a great idea. The problem was many of us were not-for-profits and we had zero dollars to run this 
Uh, we have uh, anybody who works in a not-for-profit probably does 100 different things, including your job. So none of us really had time to plan this either. And we all had different timelines on what we wanted it to look like. For example, some of us uh, who were working in some of the smaller community-based organizations uh, where you only have two staff, they weren't able to uh, free up a staff for a whole Saturday's worth of training because then who would watch their children? So what we did was we had a huge challenge. Uh, we decided to just apply for the grant anyways and then deal with the issues later. So what we, <laughs> we uh, applied to the ministry uh, for a summer experience grant for a coordinator, and we were successful in getting that. So once we got that coordinator, we really needed to get our act together and kind of figure out exactly what we were going to do. So we posted for uh, this uh, coordinator, and we gave her these instructions, very limited. Uh, we want it to be a free conference. We don't have a budget, and if you did have a budget, it would only be $100. We want there to be food at the conference. We want the conference in September. And we want to engage all youth workers in Hamilton and make it relevant for anybody who's working with Hamilton youth. So a tall order for her to fill. And remember, uh, the person that we hired is a youth herself. She was 20. So uh, first time she's ever planned a conference this large. So we hired the most amazing youth named Janelle. And uh, she started off by meeting with all the different agencies to kind of learn what we all have to offer because we're so, although we all work with youth, um, what we do with them is vastly different. Uh, she also asked us, what could you donate to this conference? So whether it be our uh, expertise for a training session, maybe it's some swag that we might have kicking around, or maybe it's uh, printing, um, printing flyers, you know, pens, paper, anything. Again, we wanted to make it a free conference and we had no budget. Uh, so Janelle compiled all of this data that she got from the youth serving agencies and uh, started to make some determinations. And one of those was that we were going to run the conference on a Saturday, um, but knowing that that didn't, didn't meet everybody's needs, we were going to run a full day session divided into two halves. So you could either go to the morning half or the afternoon half or stay for the whole day. So we're trying to include everybody and uh, that met everybody's needs on YSAN. Then we also didn't have a venue and no money for a venue. So what one of our YSAN agency members did was uh, approach the school board, the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board, and we were able to uh, get the board to agree that they were going to uh, give us a school, which was uh, centrally located in downtown Hamilton, where most of the youth serving agencies are, and they were going to use their community use of schools funding to give it to us for free. However, they needed to talk to the principal and wouldn't be able to confirm with us until late August. And we wanted to hold the conference in September. So some more challenges. So we began what Janelle and I called the waiting game. I was her mentor through this process and uh, she was trying to determine exactly what sessions we were going to offer, um, but many of the YSAN members at that point were on vacation. The school board and the principal were on vacation, um, and Janelle had some other ideas to engage youth from Hamilton, from uh, recognized groups, but they were also on summer vacation. So you can see we had some challenges. Uh, we decided to go ahead, send out some save the dates, just with missing the location. We decided what Saturday it was going to be on. We knew it was going to be a conference for youth workers, and we knew it was going to be free. So we sent the save the dates and we developed everything else. So as soon as we got that information, all we had to do was input it and then send it. Um, we determined the sessions uh, based on the preferences from the uh, YSAN members. So Janelle came up with 12 ideas of conferences that could be had by our uh, YSAN members. And uh, we narrowed it down to four. So what we were going to do, like I said, we were going to do two sessions in the morning. Participants would be able to pick which one they wanted to go to. Then there was going to be two keynotes uh, in the afternoon around lunch hour. And then there were another two sessions they could pick from in the afternoon. So that was amazing. Janelle also worked on securing a food donation um, and uh, some of the other little minor logistics. So fast forward to the last week of August. Janelle's last week at work, um, and we're finally getting everything coming in. We got the location confirmed. Uh, she quickly sent out the flyers and the emails, and uh, she set up registration online. So that was great. The end results, uh, we had 70 people register for the conference, um, 55 attended, and we had some drop-ins that we weren't expecting. So that was a good learning for us just to be prepared for that. 
our two keynotes, we had the Ministry of Child and Youth come out and talk about the Stepping Stone Stepping Up report. And we had our very own Carrie Kelly come out and talk about the website that you just heard about. <laughs> um, so that was great for us. Uh, the smaller sessions just focused on uh, cultural sensitivity and engaging newcomer youth, uh, how to be an ally to LGBTQ youth, uh, youth opportunities in Hamilton, what is there for them to do, and how to work with youth at risk. So we did a survey, the conference was a success, uh, everything went really well. Um, I guess our major learnings that we got from this whole event were to really put a lot of trust into our youth worker. Uh, being at the Y for 20 years, I had to even talk to my IT department to figure out how we could develop an online registration service for this conference that would be free. Uh, the Y said, we don't know of anything. So Janelle managed to find something that was cost us $1.14 US. So that fit in kind of with our free budget. <laughs> um, we want, learned really to help support uh, the youth when they're planning it. So she came up and she covered all of the big uh, ideas and kind of plans that you need for a conference. But it was some of the smaller stuff, like when she secured the food donation, she didn't, uh, it was at Lococos. We have two Lococos in Hamilton. She didn't determine which one we were going to go to to pick up the food. So I had a little bit of driving around to do. And then we had, didn't have plates and forks. So stuff that comes with more experience uh, that I had, I was like, okay, did you think about this? Did you think about that? So really in a mentorship role because she got all the big things. It was the little details that were kind of missing. Uh, we learned that the conference was valued and everybody wanted to have it again. It was, uh, it was really neat for Hamilton to have. So now we're kind of sitting in the now what situation. Um, we didn't get our funding for the youth coordinator this year. So now we're kind of looking uh, and trying to see what other grants are out there for youth um, and where we could ever possibly find somebody else who is as skilled as Janelle was. Um, and we also need to determine who's going to mentor the youth. I had the opportunity last summer to do that role. Unfortunately, my two day camp coordinators are on maternity leave this year, so I'm not going to have any time to do that. So somebody else from our uh, YSAN group is going to have to step up. So uh, it's going to be an exciting year, and I'm looking forward to seeing if we uh, pull it off again. That's us. Jill Peters. Uh, Program Coordinator, Kids Zone and Teen Zone for Fort Erie, Crystal Beach, Port Colburn, Welland, Thorold, and Chippewa. Jill Peters has been working in recreation programming for youth for over 15 years worldwide. From Acro Kids in Alaska to the Matrix Game in the Mediterranean, she believes in creative, resourceful, and divergent thinking that challenges participants to push the boundaries of personal growth and development. Jill is currently employed as a program coordinator with the Boys and Girls Club of Niagara, overseeing seven youth and teen programs regionally. Today, she will touch on a few of the activities, including their goals and outcomes currently being implemented in these after-school programs. Jill? Okay, so uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so I was asked to speak basically as your, um, more of your frontline you know, staff kind of say, I'm not actually frontline, I don't work with the kids anymore, but I supervise the staff that do. Um, so I can touch a bit more um, about uh, the different programs that you might even be able to access on Lynn. Um, uh, and I'll touch specifically on three of them and how they meet our, our uh, goals and, and whatnot. So we, as, at the Boys and Girls Club, are accredited from the High Five organization. So a lot of the programs that we implement directly have goals that relate to uh, the principles of healthy child development that um, the High Five organization uh, talk about. Um, so that being said, the first, uh, the first activity that I will talk about um, is um, uh, one that we do with the kids um, to kind of provide that caring adult role that um, the youth that we serve, the at-risk youth, um, who mo most of them are, um, it's, it's a way for them to get the, uh, to fill the gap that they might not be getting at home. A lot of our programs run right after school and they might run up until nine o'clock at night. And if you think about it, that means that um, their parents might have put them in before care, um, before they go to school, get dropped off at school. They're in school all day. We have them right after school and they're with us until, you know, up to nine, nine thirty at night. Um, so what kind of role are those parents taking in their kids' lives? Um, there's a big gap there. And obviously that's where we want to try and fill it. 
Um, so uh, the, the activity that we do with them comes, um, it's called best part, worst part. It happens in our opening circle where we take attendance and where we give the kids any um, announcements that we have. And it basically, um, it, it's, um, we, we start at the beginning of the week with best part, worst part. Um, what was the best part of your day and why? And what was the worst part and why? And it gives us a chance to um, show that as leaders, as role models, we care about these kids. Um, we are invested in their interests, in uh, what they uh, they like, what they find um, you know what what obviously is is good and makes them happy and then on the other scale um, what they find challenging what um, you know means that they've had a bad day and um, that opens up a lot of opportunities for us to then engage them further and and try and plan activities that would mean that we could you know make their day better or address some of those things that they've said oh I've had an awful day because of this or that um, so it really gets them talking talking about, um, you know, about, about them and their interests and, and how their day was. And we, um, we do other things. We, we ask them other questions, all open-ended, obviously, um, and, uh, you know, try and get them thinking about, uh, about things other than, um, you know, what stuff they're, they're talking about with their friends and, and whatnot and challenge them to kind of think a little bit um, further outside the box, etc. Um, so yeah, so that, I mean, our, our goal there is to strengthen their, their um, uh, exposure to and their bonds with a, a caring adult, right? Someone who's that uh, older figure who they might not have a lot of contact with outside of school, outside of their teacher, which is a different role altogether. Um, so the second activity uh, that I'd like to talk about is um, called K-STOMP. Um, and basically we, uh, we we like to do things, I like to do things um, a bit outside the box, a bit out of uh, the norm of what you hear is happening in uh, after school programming. Um, and something that's creative that gets the kids thinking again in a different way. And um, so this activity we've just started to implement. Um, it is, uh, it was based on Stomp, the musical or the live show that goes around touring. And uh, we've kind of modified it um, to fit our needs uh, as in an after school program. Um, so we, you know, we hope to challenge the kids to create um, their own instrument uh, you know, that, that uh, they can use, they feel comfortable with, they, you know, um, hopefully are, are thinking, uh, you know, a bit innovatively um, in terms of what they get. And, um, and then we break the kids into to smaller groups and, and we have vo kids volunteer to be the conductors of their own mini shows. And then at the end of the session, they present it um, in front of all the kids. And obviously they take turns being the conductors. And um, it's just a great way of, of um, letting them express their creativity um, and exposing them to new things that maybe they haven't been exposed to. A lot of times, you know, this might be, they've, they've maybe never heard of something like this because obviously their parents can't afford to bring them to a show like this. And so that would be something they would, wouldn't have exposure to. And, and, and you know, we, f we feel like it's our duty as, as aftercare workers to provide them with that exposure to these new and interesting creative ideas. Um, so the last activity that, um, that we uh, have just started to implement is called Acro Kids. Um, we are trying to, really address the um, issue of um, l the lack of physical literacy that's happening right now with our youth. Um, and by exposing them to new forms of physical activity, we're hoping that we can get, we can pique the kids' interest and, and, and develop skills um, and an interest in them early on that will hopefully uh, continue the process for them of learning new physical activities and being involved and getting moving and active and whatnot. So um, Acro Kids is, um, I guess it's a new trend um, in uh, fitness for adults as well right now, kind of like the Zumba thing has started. Um, now the Acro thing um, is, is starting. And so we've... Um, 
scaled it down into a smaller, safer uh, version of what happens when you, you know, in gymnastics programs and whatnot. Um, and it's basically, we're trying to challenge them to do different things um, and to, to express themselves um, through body movements that aren't usual, you know, i.e. the traditional, bat, let's play basketball after school or, you know, let's uh, run around the gym five times or do jumping jacks, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a, a way that um, is, we approach it in a non-threatening way to hopefully uh, increase the, the participation or the, at least the interest in uh, the activity. So that's... Um, that's our third, uh, we've, I've, I have done it before, actually on a cruise ship, go figure, um, with kids. And it was extremely successful and we are just starting to be in the planning stages of it now and looking into what resources we can pull, um, i.e. gymnastic teachers and whatnot, again on a limited budget, i.e. none. Um, so uh, stay tuned for hopefully some success stories or maybe even trends happening um, with that. Yeah, so um, that's, that's it short and sweet for me. Um, I hope that I could have been a good link for uh, some of the programs that you run or you, um, you, know, you have staff running. Um, generally, I think we, you know, we're trying to, all of us here, we are, care, we are concerned and, and um, are trying to better the physical, emotional, social, intellectual uh, growth and development of the kids that we serve. And, um, and my piece specifically, I like to do it in a way that's a bit uh, out of the box thinking, innovative, stuff that will push the kids to, um, you know, to, to try new things because I am so passionate about thinking that that's where greatness comes from, really, right, is the new stuff. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Thank you. Um, so given the acro kids part, when you think of acro right away, it's like high risk activity, et cetera, <laughs> yes. et cetera. What types of training and whatnot go with the staff as they're leading those activities? Right, and that's the part that we're kind of just into now. Um, but basically we're looking at meeting with a qualified gymnast or a gymnastic instructor, right, um, who could teach that. And a lot of the, it isn't, um, huge scale, you know, like they do competing with and whatnot, right? It's more um, smaller um, movements and positions um, that include low risk, you know, activities and whatnot. So obviously we do it on mats. Um, we partner kids up um, based on, you know, their, their Com how comfortable they are in doing the different activities, their skill level, right? Um, so, so that as well, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Where do you run your programs out of? Um, do you run any of your programs out of any social housing um, sites or would it be in community based uh... yeah we have um, we in Fort Erie which is where um, our locations main offices we do have a, a club in the community that we serve um, that's that's owned by us um, but uh, the rest of the programs run out of schools in the area yeah in the in the area that's areas that have been identified as uh, you know having a lot of high risk needs that of kids that need serve being served, yeah. So in that um, social housing community um, that you're serving, uh, was it a struggle to break into that community and how is your registration and does it drop or, or does it seem to be consistent? Um, I don't think it was a struggle to break into it, though I wasn't around at the beginning when those programs had started. Um, in terms of participation, um, the numbers are pretty consistent. Um, we offer transportation uh, for a lot of the sites where we're, 
we've identified that there is a need greater than the immediate area that we serve, so that helps with participation. Um, also in the sites where the program comes right from school, we pick the kids up literally in their school right from school. Again, the participation is, is uh, pretty consistent. Um, it fluctuates a bit um, in the winter with weather, um, even, even with uh, sites that have, uh, that have uh, transportation. Um, but other than that, it's, it's pretty much consistent. Yeah, I think, I mean, our program, we, uh, the membership for the whole year for this program for each kid is $5. Um, and it's waived if they, if parents uh, identify that they can't afford that. So um, it's pretty accessible that way financially for them. And, and so I think that draws a lot of parents to our program and keeps them there, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, it relates to fees for okay. programs. Um, are some of these pieces, I'm from Halton, the Halton area, and we certainly have um, some buy-in from the uh, child care subsidies, et cetera, for programs that qualify based on all those good things like High Five and the things we've been talking about. From a pricing point of view, would these types of programs fall under that, or is this something in addition to, or do the school boards, I'm just trying to think where all the dollars come from. For my program specifically, the ones that I was talking about, the after school programs, they all fall within that $5 fee. Um, we do offer sport and recreation programs, ball hockey, gymnastics, dance, that kind of thing, which are an additional cost. Um, and I think roughly they're like th it's like thirty seven bucks for ten weeks of programming, and even that um, can be uh, waived by us as the Boys and Girls Club if if um, the parents don't qualify for um, our two other funders, which are Pro Kids and Jumpstart. Um, yeah, so really we we you know we try and make it so that. Fin you know, financially, Affordable there are no barriers for them, right? Obviously. Yeah. I was just curious in those respects. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to give a little bit of context in regards to my uh, question, I work for a municipal organization, and we currently have the Ministry of Tourism, Sport, and Culture's uh, after-school program, which is great. We offer it at uh, five uh, municipal rec centers. It's extremely successful because we have all the amenities and... Uh, we go to the schools, we watch the schools, and we bring them over to our centers. Um, but one of our drops in regards to regular registration programming is our child and youth areas. Uh, when I think about after-school programs, I think from 3 p.m. till 6 p.m. Um, now kids, I mean, they can come over to the school. Sometimes they have a longer way to travel, but it's sometimes the parents that don't want to necessarily bring their uh, kids to a rec center because after they're done work, the last thing they want to do is more activities. They want to sit out on the couch, maybe have family dinner, and the last thing they want to do is something from, you know, three to six. Not everyone's going to have that mentality. What strategies are there to overcome that to help sell to increase the after-school programs outside of grant programs to increase the recruitment of, you know, the kids to participate in the programs? Like, what is it that we can do to kind of help sell it more? My experience with my uh, recreation had it on is that children bring children and engagement with the schools is key. So uh, especially with that age group of six to 12 year olds, uh, you have an engaged child who's having fun in an after school program, they will bring their friends. That, that, is one of, uh, that was one of our marketing techniques and strategies. The other piece is we do a lot of stakeholder engagement uh, and what we have heard from our community partners when we've been working with the strategy is that, that families uh, uh, want care to happen in the schools. And so taking the programs to the schools is key. And, but then of course that means as uh, we heard here that you need school buy-in. And uh, a lot of that, it relates to the principles because it's an added on, that's the mentality of it, uh, that it's an added on for that principle. So uh, working with the, the family of schools, uh, be that the group of principals, the uh, superintendent and the trustee around uh, creating a hub or a hub-like uh, model and behavior 
uh, has been one of the key things that has increased participation. And specifically for us, like touching on the principal thing, we we work with really great principals where we are, and um, they publish online on their school website mm -hmm. our monthly calendars with all of the activities. They make announcements if we have a special event coming up. They're making announcements in the school to all the kids and getting them, you know, excited about what programming we're doing too. So we're in a great partnership mm -hmm. that way as well. So that helps us advertise our program too. But yeah, definitely. I think one struggle that we've had. Um, is that the principals are definitely key to the kids. However, when there's such a high turnover rate with the principals themselves, it's very tough to maintain healthy relationships with the school system. Um, and you also need to have the principal's buy in. Once you get that buy in, it's easy to retain you know, the, the program growth and, and so forth. Um, but the challenges that we sometimes face is that, you know, breaking the ice to get into the, the principal's office to share them with whatever it is without making it seem like it's a sales pitch. Because that's sometimes what we feel that we're doing is we're just sitting there, we're telling them everything that is that we can do. And here's the overall cost. And they're like, oh, well, this person just said another salesman. Is there any strategies that you guys have to make it seem less like a sales pitch call or? I run a... Uh at the YMCA, I run free programs after school, some that are funded through the ministry and some that are privately funded through the Strong Kids, uh, our internal campaign. And what we do is we not only try to build the relationship with the principal, but we really focus on the school staff. So every time we're having a parent event, we engage the school staff as well. Because if you're getting the teachers on board and they're believing in your program as well, um, they're going to be referring students to your program. And then if your principal's switching or your vice principal's switching, then you still have the teachers buying in. So we have a Every time we have a parent event, all I would say the majority of the school staff are there and they're participating in the uh, event as well. So we find that that really helps us out a lot. I have one more quick point to add too, that the, currently the Ministry of Education has repealed the Day Nurseries Act. And so there is work happening with both the legislative framework and the regulatory framework of the Day Nurseries Act. And municipalities uh, responded to that repeal around what should child care look like and in that was also responses around um, what does care for six to 12 year olds look like and one of the pieces that is coming out of that and our strategy actually and the research actually gave us some of the information to be able to respond so the city of toronto and the middle childhood coalition uh, did a response that identified that um, we need consistent work with school boards and the Ministry of Education, and they need to really address the 6 to 12 year olds. And the Ministry of Education has identified that that is the next age group that they will address. They have looked at the 4 and 5 year olds. The next age group will be the 6 to 12. So it'll be interesting for all of us as uh, providers and um, recreationists uh, to be able to see what, what that looks like and what happens with that because that's going to mandate the schools to work with us related to care for 6 to 12 year olds.